Doc Talk is brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the science of healthier animals. Hey folks, welcome to Doc Talk. We're going to talk about anaplasmosis in beef cows. I've got a very special guest, a friend of mine, a student of mine, um, going to be one of the best veterinarians in cows, period, Mark Spare. From Ashland, Kansas, we're going to talk about anaplasmosis and some of the work he's done on that topic. As dependable as the sunrise, in dairy parlors, open pastures, on ranches and feed yards across America, a place where reputation is more than a name, where the science of healthier animals is a way of life. It's the responsibility that drives who we are and what we do, every decision, every day. It's your livelihood and our responsibility. Closed captioning brought to you by Colostrix Colostrum Supplement and Replacer. Proven to provide essential immunity and help prevent scours from E. coli. Trust your newborn calf health to Colostrix from AgriLabs. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council, improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hey folks, welcome to the show. I'm here with my friend and colleague, Mark Spare, soon to be Dr. Dr. Mark Spare. Um, Dr. Spare is a fourth year veterinary student here at Kansas State University and he's working on his PhD. He has more experience with beef cattle than a lot of veterinarians that have been out there five to ten years or twenty and uh, we're very lucky to have him here at Kansas State University. Um, Mark, we're, you've been working on anaplasmosis and um, I consider you one of our experts in that area here in the, in the U.S. And, and globally, especially in, in beef cattle. Uh, just let's talk about the background of anaplasmosis and what, what people should understand about that disease. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good place to start, Dr. Thompson. And, and really, um, when we think about anaplasmosis, it, there's a lot of maybe misinformation out there, but it, there's a lot of enigma surrounding it because it can appear and then disappear and be quiet for quite a while. But what we've got is a, a facultative gram negative or a gram negative facultative anaerobe. Uh, it's a bacteria that can infect the red blood cells uh, of beef cattle or of, of cattle. So that specifically is going to be a bug called Anaplasma marginale. Okay. Uh, there are other Anaplasma species out there that can affect horses, uh, they can affect sheep, they can affect dogs, they can affect humans. There are others overseas that are different, but when we think about Anaplasmosis in the United States, we need to be thinking about Anaplasma marginale. So, so it's a bacteria that goes from one animal to the other um, how do we get it? How does it transfer? So, well, it, it's going to infect the red blood cells of the host animal. Um, to, to transfer anaplas from animal to animal or to get it into naive animals, we need blood transfer. Uh, when we think about blood transfer, we've got a couple of different mechanisms, and those are going to be specifically uh, mechanisms, uh, insect mechanisms. Those would okay. be biting flies, yeah. such as horse flies and stable flies. Uh, house flies aren't going to do it because they don't bite and, and take blood from animal to animal. Ticks are going to do it. Now ticks are specific uh, or special in that they can actually take in uh, anaplas from a host animal, multiply it in their midgut and in their salivary glands and so they can multiply or uh, uh, take a, a small amount and make it a bigger amount in the environment. Yep. 
Okay, then we got to think about what we can do, and we can transfer it with our needles. Needle pokes, uh, there's been some really good research done by uh, some of our colleagues here at Kansas State that show the efficiency of that. Um, we we got to think about our tattoo guns, so there's some tools that, that we can do it. Do we think about OB sleeves today? No, not, not in the same realm that we think about it as relating to BLV, but any time that we can see transmission of blood products from animal to animal, yeah. Quickly, um, just go through what does a cow with anaplasmosis look like as we wrap up? For yeah, so uh, a, similar to other diseases, not every animal reads a book, okay? All naive animals can be affected and infected and affected by this disease. Younger animals, animals less than two years, and that's a generalized statement, but less than two years of old are not going to tend to show uh, severe clinical signs. You're probably not even going to see them uh, uh, go down with this disease or, or get off. Animals older than two years of age, we think about, uh, can display signs. They can get yellowed skin under their eyes or, or if they're um, female bovines and around their uh, other genitalia. Uh, we can think about aggression from the hypoxia as the red blood cells are destroyed going through the animal. We can think about lethargy uh, maybe they're going off feed if you're in a dairy or in a confined cow system. Um, they, can, they can go down, they can be rail thin and not display any of these other signs if they're out in the pasture. Uh, but lagging behind, aggression, those are the signs that we think about seeing. Cool. We're going to go to commercial. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about some creepy crawly ticks and anaplasmosis. Thanks for joining me today for Beringer Ingelheim's Cattle First. When we start to think about labels that are on bottles of antibiotics, it's extremely important that we follow them. The first thing that's on the label, what species is this indicated for? So it might be for cattle, for horses, for dogs, or cats. Once we understand the species that these products are labeled for, what's the indication? Bovine respiratory disease. Uh, could it be for foot rot? There's a list of species indications. After that, what's the dosage, what's the route of administration, and then what's the withdrawal time or the time in which it's safe to take an animal to slaughter from the time in which the animal was last treated until, until that animal was slaughtered. So, species, indication, dosage, route of administration, withdrawal. All of these are important components on a label, so make sure that you follow them and use antibiotics judiciously. Beringer Ingelheim's Cattle First. It must be a, a, an inherited trait because I have never wanted to do anything other than be in the cattle business. And it's interesting as I have grandchildren now, little bitty ones, all they want to do is go to the barn, swing a rope, and be a cowboy. It's, it's something, it's a, it's a lifestyle that we have, the way we make a living, obviously. But it's really more than that. It gives us the opportunity as a family to be able to work together and enjoy each other's company and make a living at the same time. We've been using Triangle for years, and the reason we do it has been safe and effective, and we're going to continue to do that. We'll put the cows in the chute twice a year spring and fall. 100% of our cattle get vaccinated with Triangle. If my calves start healthy and stay healthy, I've got a good shot at making money. That is why I trust Clostrix. It gives my calves the protection they need until their own immune systems kick in. Calf raisers trust Colostrix Colostrum Supplements. Colostrix is USDA licensed and proven effective. When your money is on the line, trust Colostrix. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council, improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hey folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Mark Spare. 
We are talking about anaplasmosis. We're at Kansas State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. Talk to me about, the, you know, we talked about ticks being special and transmitting anaplasma. Um, why? How? What? What, what's special about that? Yeah, so uh, as we talked about on the last little, little piece, uh, ticks can take a small amount and make it a large amount. We like to use the term biological magnification, which we have to explain, so it's better to just say small to large. But ticks can take in the bacteria, and, and it, as a part of their immune system, um, it can go into their midgut or their intestines, and it multiplies and it interacts with their immunity, uh, but to, again, take a small amount of the bacteria and, and make a tick that can infect an animal with every bite, okay, with every, with every blood transfer. Um, that's what makes them special. So a few ticks in the environment can then take uh, and, and seed or um, create a home for anaplasma to exist for a long period of time, through the duration of their lifetime. Gotcha. Now, I think in, in considering ticks, we gotta say, and, and we really need to hammer that not every tick can, can become infected, not every tick can transmit, and not every tick that can do both of those things, become infected and transmit, is infected. Okay, so there's some work done um, in the southeast, southeast part of Kansas that uh, a lot of anaplasmosis down there, historically, the ticks that are down there that can carry, we're thinking of the American dog tick, Dermacenter uh, uh, ticks, maybe one out of three. Carry or can, can carry? Or, or are carrying okay. down there, which is, which is a lot. Uh, but those are not the predominant tick in the environment. The predominant tick is one that a lot, uh, that we and a lot of our viewers would recognize as the, the Lone Star tick, uh, Amblyoma americanum, that has that small dot on their back, that's the female. There's another male, uh, well, a male gender of that tick as well that's an adult. Uh, those are not our known vectors in, in Kansas and, and really throughout, uh, in my understanding, the United States. So not every tick is gonna carry it, not every tick that can carry it is infected, uh, which means that there becomes an issue of environment uh, in, this tick, in this tick idea. Where those ticks predominate sometimes the disease is not present because it hasn't been introduced and, and those ticks haven't been allowed to become biological magnifiers. Where those ticks are not the predominant tick, but that the disease is, is heavy or, or infested in that region, a lot more of the ticks can become infected and then play host to that disease for a longer period of time. It makes perfect, perfect sense. So if the disease is present and the ticks present, gonna have an issue it can be there for a long time cool yeah well can we agree that all ticks are bad <laughs> <laughs> well, to me there's no doubt but uh <laughs> their ticks are a challenge and they do and they do carry a lot of other diseases i think at this point in advocacy for uh maybe the the right medical decisions um and support of the medical profession there don't be pouring stuff on ticks that are attached to you you know, remove those just as you would from your animal, pull those ticks off with the mouth parts if you can, but um, just like in cattle, when we traumatize those ticks, they tend to just spew all the diseases that they have in their salivary glands into those. So you can, uh, you can get pretty bad shape on cattle, on yourself, uh, but protect yourself and listen to, your, listen to your doctor. Cool. More on anaplasmosis with Mark Sparer after these messages. You spent countless hours building a strong operation. But when it comes to trichomoniasis, the odds are stacked against you. It takes just one infected bull to take down the whole herd. Damage could include open cows, lost pregnancies, and lost profits. The good news is with TrickCard, a herd doesn't have to feel like a house of cards. When you're in the cattle business, no matter how much it's a business, it still starts with cattle. It's this basic notion that sits at the core of how we approach things at Beringer Engelheim. 
We understand when you put the cattle first, it just naturally leads to doing the right things. If you want to do well in this business, you start by doing right. Take care of the cattle, and they'll take care of you. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council. Improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hey folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dan Thompson here with Mark Spare, and we're talking about anaplasmosis in beef cows, which has been a, a growing issue throughout the United States. Lots of discussion because it affects cow herds and your livelihood. And Mark has been doing some of the leading edge research on anaplasmosis, especially here in the state of Kansas. And I would just like him to kind of share with us what he's done and, and kind of the scope of the project and some of their findings. Yeah, I appreciate that, Dr. Thompson. And, and I, I have been uh, very blessed to be a part of um, some of this cutting edge research. I think we've got a great team here. We've got a great crew at Kansas State, a lot of colleagues that are interested in this disease. Uh, we've got a lot of momentum um, uh, for, for our study of this from a molecular standpoint uh, all the way up to uh, uh, an individual standpoint of the cow and how do we treat individual cows. Um, one, of the, one of the aspects that my research is specifically focused on uh, is helping producers answer, um, do I need to address, do I have a problem, is it big enough that I need to address this problem? Um, and when we look at the state as a whole, the state of Kansas, we really didn't know how to answer the question of where is anaplas and how much is where? Um, those questions have been asked and, and it's really a challenge to answer that, but throughout the past 50 years even, um, and there's a band of anaplasmosis that tracks through the central U.S. all the way up. Um, historically, it's been in Idaho, Montana, Northern California, um, so we've all had our challenges with it. But specifically our study, we, we wanted to ask where is it and how much. So we, we took the state of Kansas and divided it into nine districts. We randomly selected veterinarians in each district and had them correspond with producers that they interact with on a yearly basis to obtain blood samples from cow herds throughout the state. Uh, so we were looking at this problem from a cow herd level. Uh, each veterinarian uh, at each of those herds that was sampled took 10 blood samples. Those came back to Kansas State and we assayed those uh, with two different diagnostic tests, or one specifically and then one as a, as a confirmatory. Uh, and we, we ended up sampling 9,250 cows in the state of Kansas. So um, that, that's a lot. It, it's a lot. It's a, it's a representative sample. It's not a complete sample, but we were very pleased with the response we got. That was a state effort. Personally, you know, it's, it's challenging for me to present the data without, uh, yeah. frankly, becoming emotional about the, even the, the uh, participation we had from our student body in making that happen. It was, it was truly a Kansas effort. Um, so what we found uh, when we sampled that, uh, again, we went from northwest to southeast, one through nine. Uh, in the southeast part of the state, we did end up with 87.2% of sampled herds were infected uh, uh -huh. by antibody presence. Okay. Yep. So that would tell us that that could be um, a little bit biased one way or the other as far as the use of the vaccine down there, but we did, uh, we did address that in our study as well. But 87.2% of herds in the southeast part of the state compared to 18% um, of herds in the northwest part of the state being infected. Okay, uh, the, in the southwest part of the state, where we, uh, we looked at and we had a, a really good participation, we ended up with 33% of those herds were infected. Uh, in the northeast part of the state where we're at, Dr. Thompson, we ended up with about 80.9% 80, 80 of herds infected. Uh, in the central part of the state, I think, you know, really we went 43%, 56%, and 43% from north to south. So a significant amount of herds have a presence of anaplas in their cows. All right, we're gonna take a break. When we come back, we're gonna follow up with some of the other findings from this study, moving east to west, big differences in prevalence of anaplasmosis more after this break. If my calves start healthy and stay healthy, I've got a good shot at making money. That is why I trust Clostrix. 
It gives my calves the protection they need until their own immune systems kick in. Calf raisers trust Colostrix Colostrum Supplements. Colostrix is USDA licensed and proven effective. When your money is on the line, trust Colostrix. Some call it a come from behind victory, an unlikely win, a reversal of fortune, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. This is our moment, our victory dance, because we choose confidence. We choose Zuprivo for BRD treatment. Ask your veterinarian to prescribe Zuprivo. Zuprivo is a fast acting, long lasting BRD treatment that you can count on to get the job done. Choose confidence. Choose Zuprivo from Merck Animal Health. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council. Improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hey folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dan Thompson here with Mark Spare. We're talking about anaplasmosis and, and your research. So Mark, you showed how the, there was difference from one end of the state to the other, and obviously that's where the disease is and where the ticks are, and it's and and it's it's spreading north and west. Um, tell me what are some of the other things you found when you the things that herds did or herds didn't do that had an influence on positive or negative status. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question, and that's something we did. We sent a survey out with all these veterinarians to uh, ad administer, if you will, at the herd level, at the ranch level. Um, and we got a pretty good response out of the 925 herds that participated. I think we had 780 surveys completed. So really, really positive. Um, Huge. We investigated management strategies or management practices uh, really from, from top to bottom. So not only what do you vaccinate for, but how many vaccines do you use uh, to, you know, provision of mineral, inclusion of CTC in that mineral, to knowledge of anaplas and, and how you interact and manage around that. The, the management practices that we found to be associated with positive status or anaplas mm -hmm. status, and, and I qualify that term associated, I don't, we're not implying that there's a right. causational uh, relationship here, but um, the herds that utilized prescribed pasture burning were more likely to be infected. The herds that utilize insecticide impregnated ear tags were more likely to be infected. And the herds that vaccinate for anaplasmosis were more likely to be infected. Okay, now, in some regards, that's a little counterintuitive. In some regards, it's pretty intuitive because we see a lot of those practices take place more on the eastern side of the state. Exactly. Vaccination could be that we have a problem, so we vaccinate for it, and therefore, we've already got the problem present. The vaccine that we have in the United States currently and, and, it, and is legal for use in Kansas does not prevent infection, but rather it reduces the, the severity of clinical signs. So we could have a problem, have maybe a couple of cows get infected, we begin to vaccinate for it, and that infection continues to spread throughout the cow herd, but we don't see the severity of clinical signs. Uh, you know, in the in the. So it makes a little sense that the places that burn, places that have the ear tags, and places that are vaccinating, are the places where it's the most prevalent. That's exactly right, and and it and and it becomes, you can picture from east to west in the state the diversity of the landscapes. Yeah. And there's a, there's. And the grasses. And signif significant differences in environment and and the home place for ticks, the the. Uh, species of ticks and um, even the fly populations that are present in those. So those are those were a couple good management practices to help us build a, an idea of what um, an infected herd looks All like. All right, we got 30 seconds for you to just describe what we need to do diagnostically. Yeah, I think if we, you need to talk with your veterinarian and say, we've been, maybe we've had some inexplicable deaths, maybe we've had some stillborn, maybe we've had some cows getting skinny and uh, looking bad coming back in the summer, do we have a problem? And I think you need to sit down with your veterinarian or call Kansas State, say, do we have a problem? Can we address it? From there, we can, we can uh, screen the herd with an, an ELISA blood test. Mm -hmm. We can test individuals with PCR. Uh, the challenge on a, on a dead cow that we find anaplas in her spleen is we can't tell you how much there was 
and if that was her cause of death. Gotcha. And there are other causes that can take cows from us in the middle of the summer, such as BLV, heat stroke, uh, other, other diseases. So support your vet, get with your vet. Do we have a problem and how do we address that? Right, animal could die, could be a carrier of anaplasmosis, doesn't mean that's what it was. Thanks for watching Doc Talk. Remember, always work with your local veterinarian. If you wanna know more about what we do, you can find us on the web at www.doctalktv.com. Dr. Dan Thompson here with soon to be Dr. Mark Spare. We're at Kansas State. Thanks for watching and we'll see you down the road. Closed captioning brought to you by Colostrix Colostrum Supplement and Replacer. Proven to provide essential immunity and help prevent scours from E. coli. Trust your newborn calf health to Colostrix from AgriLabs. For more information about this program or previous programs, go to DocTalkTV.com. DocTalk was brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the science of healthier animals.